Protecting your family. Hey, fellas and ladies, how you doing? Nina Riaz Qureshi. Nina, all right. Is Robin Wright still here? Robin Wright, I'm on. Uh, surviving sister, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep, yep, yep. Zarina, how are you? Idiota Apologetics. That's my brother right there in Jesus Christ, who's been a gracious host. I put up with him, and he puts up with me. So uh, hit his, uh, subscribe to his YouTube channel. Hit the like. He's going to be producing more videos by the grace of Jesus. Pray for him and his family. Pray the Lord Jesus uses all of us, right? Pray the Lord Jesus sanctifies all of us. Pray the Lord Jesus transforms all of us. Pray the Lord Jesus purifies all of us to be washed in the holy blood of Jesus Christ, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Pray the Lord Jesus help me to walk in holiness in the power of the Holy Spirit, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus will give me victory to just crucify my flesh, die to my flesh, not to succumb to my flesh, not to indulge my flesh, despise my flesh. And ask the Lord Jesus, when you're praying for me and my children, ask the Lord Jesus to help me overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit, my impatience, my unrighteous anger, my pride, my arrogance, to truly have humility and humbleness and to be teachable, to let the Holy Spirit teach me through even the men and women of God that he's raised up. Because we got a lot of outstanding Christian brothers and sisters who are blessed with wisdom from the Holy Spirit. And that I need to be reminded that I need to be more teachable, humble. I don't know everything. And that without Jesus, I'm nothing. And we need Jesus. Amen. Just keep praying for that. Pray for holiness and purity. And ask the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, Yahweh, Father, Holy Spirit, to get my health back, right? But more importantly, importantly, to be sold out for the glory of Jesus Christ, to be on fire for Jesus Christ, to passionately love Jesus, to be a prayer warrior, fasting, singing, praying, serving, not just praying, but serving by my deeds, serving those in need, truly loving them by my actions in Jesus' name. Please, Father, we need you. Lord Jesus, we need you. Holy Spirit, we need you. Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Cleanse us and purify us in the holy blood of the Son of God. And fill us with the Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. I'm just waiting for a few more fa faces to show up. This session, I'm going to devote to the honor of the victims of 9-11. Revelation 22, 13, I haven't been seeing you, brother. I, uh, to be honest with you, Nina, if it's an inside job or not, I really don't care. I'm still going to use this occasion to expose Muhammad for the glory of Jesus Christ and trust the Holy Spirit to fill me, to glorify Jesus Christ, to magnify Jesus Christ, and trust the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds, our hearts, to remove the veil, to see the depth, the beauty, the majesty of Scripture, and give us wisdom to know the Scripture and the power to live it out for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, I don't, white bot. You probably don't understand. If you're going to now nitpick and try to split hairs on what I'm saying, you know I'm going to block you, right, white bot? I don't care to get into the debate whether it's inside job or not. So let me explain myself because I think I'm going to block you. Because if it's an inside job or if it's an outside job, people have their opinion and someone who's already convinced won't be convinced otherwise. So if you're convinced it's an inside job, can I unconvince you? And if you're convinced it was Muslim terrorists, can I unconvince you? You see how stupid that reaction is, my brother? Okay. So I'm going to ask you, because I don't want to waste time. I'm trying to exercise patience. You got to be careful what you pray for, honestly. A sister said that. When you ask Jesus to teach you to be patient, he sends people to test your patience so you perfect your ability by the power of the Holy Spirit to control yourself. So pray for me. Holy Spirit will give me power to be self-controlled and die to my flesh and walk in the life and the power of the Holy Spirit, right? In Jesus' name. Now, let me ask you a question, white bot. Do you believe it's an inside job? Good. Get lost. Yeah. Idiot. You get my point? If you believe it's an inside job, can I convince you otherwise? Yes, I know. And it's very Christ-like of you to come here, 
Be a distraction used of the devil. I thought you're leaving. Leave. If you want to stick around, answer my question. Okay. Do you believe it's an inside job? Let's make it quick. Do you believe it's an inside job? See, thank you. See, this is exactly my point. Here's a guy who believes in conspiracy theories, the Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, right? The Trilateral Commission, the Masons. It's They're all working together to bring about a one world government to usher in the coming of the Antichrist so that 9-11 really was an inside job to blame the Muslims to find a pretext to invade Muslim lands. See? You see what a dog he is? You see, again, he's a filthy dog. Try to convince me. You see? This is a dog of Satan wanting attention. You see? So he proved my point. No, I'm not interested. You're a dog. I don't stoop my, to your level. Get out of here. People wonder why I'm so nice. Yeah, go watch his channel too. See how how enlightened he is. Yeah, idiots. And if you guys have a problem with name calling, you got a problem with the Holy Bible, guys. I am going to admit I have imperfections, anger issues, but in Jesus' name, by the blood of Jesus, He's going to cleanse me. The Holy Spirit is going to transform me for the glory of Jesus in Jesus' name. But to say that you can't call someone names, I'm going to do a session where you're going to find the biblical prophets, our Lord Jesus, who's God in the flesh, perfection in the flesh, and the apostles calling people names. Oh, but you're not an apostle, brother. You're not walking in the spirit like they are. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You got to admit, though, I look younger and I look handsomer, right? Come on, man. God has made me beautiful. Don't hate. Hey, Revelation 22, 13, I haven't seen you in a while, man. Have you been keeping up with my live streams? I will Hagia Sophia films. Don't, don't believe the hype. The reason why they will say that is because you have what's called, what I call, American European churchianity. A churchianity that doesn't resemble biblical Christianity. A churchianity where you have now pastors, churches, running the church like a CEO. And the pastor is like a businessman, so you have to talk a certain way, dress a certain way, and can't step on toes because you may not be able to sell your product, right? Which is why now you have pastors compromising, perverting themselves in the gospel, capitulating to issues such as same-sex marriage, right? The LGBT issues and a host of other problems. Because why? It's because the church is being run like a business, and it's a product. And, and if we offend people, then we can't sell our product. Right? Jeffrey, who are you, man? And why do you want to know if I'm going to the Strong Tower Conference? With a name like Jeffrey Dahmer, I don't think I want to see you there. Jeffrey Dahmer was a murderer in Illinois. He used to eat his victims. But then why are you going to be there? Are you planning on eating us too, Jeffrey? Jeffrey Dahmer? Your name, dude. Change your name. You scared me, brah. Jeffrey Dahmer? Wow, man. Anyway, I'm waiting for our brother Protestant believer to show up. And we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about two things. What I want to do today, I felt led. And you know what? Actually, interestingly, James White, our brother in Jesus Christ, just did a session right now, a dividing line today. And he mentioned sola fide, justification by faith in Christ alone. And he quoted Clement of Rome which is a letter that some actually date in the 90s AD, and some actually make a case it was written before 70 AD, before the destruction of Jerusalem, because he alludes to priests, right, as a present reality in his day. And he mentioned sola fide. And it's interesting because someone had asked me an excellent question yesterday about Romans chapter 2, verses 48. And I spent time unpacking it for his benefit, and I truly believe that I should unpack it here for your benefit so you can have the peace of mind the joy and peace of your salvation, that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the God-man, an infinitely perfect Savior who perfectly saves you if you trust in Him. Because it will tie in with 9-11. Yeah. 
I just want to say, Barack, are you here? Are you on my channel? All right. I want to do that, but I want to first. I want to do two things, God willing, in honor of the victims of 9/11. Since I have no problem believing that it was 19 Muslim terrorists that did did the job, and I'm not interested in getting into the debate whether it was a government setup. I'm going to focus on why 19 Muslims would murder, quote unquote. When I say quote unquote, because them they're not innocent, innocent people and then kill themselves in the process. Okay, I want to talk about that in the context of the assurance of salvation our Lord Jesus gives us. But before that, I want to roast Muhammad. I try not to be unnecessarily offensive, but I don't want to be politically correct and tickle ears. And so Muslims, here's what I'm going to tell you. It may upset you, but I'm going to be honest. Muhammad to me is an antichrist, son of a uh, son of the devil, and one of the most vicious, wicked, immoral antichrists the world has ever seen. And my prayer is that Jesus Christ, who's truly alive, who is the risen Lord of glory, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will open the minds and hearts of Muslims to escape this wicked, evil son of Satan and fall in love with Jesus Christ. Okay. So I'm going to show you how Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus. Okay, well, Barak, what's your name here so I can proceed to unblock you? I don't know. Don't be scared, brother. I got a brother text me. He says, please don't call me out. And I just called him out. Please don't block me. And I just blocked him. I'm not going to block him. Right? Anyway, man, I don't know where Protestant believers. If not, I'm going to have to read verses. Right? Idiota is uh, in the other room watching. Hey, bro, uh, until Protestant believer gets here, do you think you can post verses in the text? If not, I'll just read them. Yeah, Fadi, you're not going to convince those who think it's an inside conspiracy, Fadi. You're wasting your time. That's why I don't engage this discussion, Fadi. When they tell me it's an inside job, all right. Hey, there goes Hater Wood. <laughs> hey, bro, listen, I don't know when you're going to start live streaming. You get about 1,000. I barely get 200, bro. Come on now. You got to help me blow up. For the glory of Jesus Christ, man. Come on, I need at least 300,000 subscribers rolling in the mullah, aren't you? And when are we going to start doing live streams together, bro? Because you know what? Without me, you're boring. You're cured to insomnia, hater would. No, but I do want to say something, and I, and I mean this. And I don't say it in front of him. And, and I mean this. This man has been through a lot. Pray that Jesus bless him. And can I just bear witness? I want to bear witness here. And it's not because he's here. God knows my heart. I mean this because I've been with him. God has blessed him with an amazing wife. And I just want to give God the glory for his blessing upon us and upon David. Because David couldn't do what he did, he's doing without such a woman. She's amazing. Pray for Marie Wood. Pray for his five boys. Pray for their family. Pray for his mother. Pray for his brothers. Right? Yeah, he goes, I'm dumb and boring. But with that said... His wife is Proverbs 31 to the upteenth degree. She loves Jesus. She's on fire for Jesus. She's a warrior. And in spite of everything around her, having two kids with special needs and having to deal with David Wood, an oversized baby, who I call Baby Yui, right, who makes ugly a crime. If ugly was a crime, he'd be America's most wanted. She's an amazing woman. And I praise Jesus Christ for her. And I say this from my heart. Lord Jesus, bless her. Give her the desires of her heart. Bless that family. Preserve them for the glory of Jesus. Right? Okay, now, Hater Wood, you can leave now. Yep, Hater Wood. Yeah. See, we got into now this debate. Is it an inside job or not? You see what that agent of Satan did? He got us to talk. Was 9-11 inside job or an outside job? Oh, come on. Irrelevant for me right now. Okay, Nina, if I don't know what Judith 822 has to do. All right, Idiotai, are you ready, my brother? Because Protestant believer is not here. I don't know why. I told them. God bless that brother. Pray for a Protestant believer. Pray for first and last. Pray for their needs. And pray for first and last for his condition that God will watch over them. God will fill them with the joy of the Spirit and cover them with the blood of Jesus and bless their families. Okay. Uh, CPs, I'm going to do it a little later. Let me just finish, and I'll try to find you because I have to go through the settings. 
Okay. Some rules to observe to help me to help you. Oh, here we go. Pistol Pete, man. Come on, dude. I know you're trying to mock Muhammad because he's filthy, but come on. Let's focus on the topic. All right. Let's focus on top. I love you, Pistol Pete. All right. Okay. Here's some rules. Help me to help you. Please, guys, do me a favor. Keep your questions relevant to the topic, please. And secondly, don't get involved in side issues, side debates, because then you're going to distract me and distract others. Please focus, because I'm here to serve you. you guys, honestly, and I mean this from my heart, the Lord Jesus doesn't need me. And I see how inadequate I am as a teacher, but I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to make me adequate to glorify Christ. My trust is in him. My hope is in him, right? But help me to help you because I want to be used of the Spirit. If the Spirit wants to use me to bless you, so don't cause us to, you know, lose focus. Let's focus, guys, all right? So today I'm going to devote this. Yeah, thank you, Nana. God bless you, sister. Today I'm going to focus on, I'm going to focus on Muhammad being under the feet of Jesus and the blessed assurance of knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, right? Because this is going to tie in with why the Muslims did what they did. In honor of the victims of 9-11, right? Our trust and hope is that they knew Jesus Christ and that when they departed, they departed by trusting in Jesus Christ and now they're in glory with Jesus, right? Yes, and do hit the like button because look, Haterwood has been doing this for 10 years. And by the way, folks, when I say about numbers, I'm partially kidding. It's not about numbers. Even if one person, if the Lord wants me to preach one, to one person, I will. But the only reason why I'm talking about numbers, I want droves of people to learn this material. I want droves of Christians, millions of Christians all over the world to learn all our material. David Wood's material, Anthony Rogers material. And when it's coming to dealing with groups like the black Hebrew Israelites, John Meme and atheism, learn John Meme's material. What do you mean? Vocab Malone's material. Our dear brother, Adam Coleman, who's an up-and-coming apologist, to learn his material. Idiotai Apologetics, he's an up-and-coming apologist. We pray for him because we need more warriors sanctified by the Spirit. We also have our brother, Edward Dalcor, a top-notch apologist who knows the Greek New Testament inside and out. I want us to all learn the material, and I want millions of Christians to learn this material because I can assure you, here's my guarantee to every one of you. You learn our stuff. Our stuff is battle-tested. Arguments we've used in the battlefield by the power of the Holy Spirit, and there is no way to refute it. There is no honest refutation of this material. But I also want to put it in perspective. I also want to put it in perspective. Don't think that your refutation or your defense of the gospel is going to make someone a Christian. It's not. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Yeah, Ian, I write for AnsweringIslam.net answeringislam.net go to individual authors there's two links where you'll find about 200 articles that i've written since 1999 by the grace of the lord jesus christ answeringislam.net and answeringislamblog.wordpress.com answeringislamblog.wordpress.com and you have act 17 apologetics hater woods youtube page and my youtube page and others and see one thing of oh hold on this hold on one thing about hater wood he's like a general He's got a mind of a general, right? Because why? Over 10 years ago, he saw that we needed to get on YouTube and do videos, and that's the way to go. I hate videos. I hate watching myself and hearing myself, so I didn't jump on board. But now look at this hater. 10 years later, over 300,000 subscribers. Each live show, he gets about 1,000. Each video, about 40,000. I'm hating on him. Lord Jesus, heal me of envy. I call him Daddy Warbucks. Making that money, player. Uh-huh. Oh, baby, I got your money. Uh-huh. I'll put the links in the description box. Answeringislam.net. Sorry, it's buffering. Sorry, it's buffering. Answeringislam.net and answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. Uh-huh. Hey, baby, I got your money. See, I'm, I'm showing you what not to do. See, I'm the kind of Christian who teaches you what to do and what not to do. So here is what you don't do. Don't sing secular music, world, worldly you know, songs. Uh-huh. Baby, I got your money. Don't sing these songs, okay? It's a sin. It's sin. You got to admit now that I've really trimmed my beard. 
I look so much younger and fresh. I'm even tempted to ask myself out, right? In fact, I have two accounts. I have a Ben Malik account and Sam Shimon. So I'm going to have Ben Malik propose to Sam Shimon. Sam, you are one gorgeous Assyrian beast. Arr! Oh, by the way, I don't know if baby face is good. Some women don't like baby face. They like rugged and mean. Guess what? We're about to begin. First last is here. Dominus, I need to lose 50 pounds. Pray I do and keep it off. Thank you, Pedro. Pedro, you are homo sapien, ese. You ma carnal. You are homo sapien all the way. Yes, right. We are Syrians, and the Syrians are just handsome. By the way, we're about to begin. First and last is here. No, he's not here, uh, Protestant believer. Maybe you can. Uh... When I used to be a bodybuilder, I used to bench 335 pounds without steroids. I never did steroids. Right now, I can only lift a pizza slice and press it off my chest, and then I curl it to my mouth. Idiota, maybe uh, first and last with it. We'll see. But now, I just want to let you know. Saturday, Saturday, listen, we're about to begin. Saturday, hopefully get over 150. In Jesus' name for your glory, Lord. Saturday, I used to be a kickboxer, yes. Yajil, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Two things I want to talk about. Saturday, this Saturday, I look greater than Sargon, Dominos. Okay, this Saturday marks a special day because this Saturday, September 14th, September 14, 1972, one of the greatest events in human history took place. September 14, 1972, in Kuwait, the sun did not set. September 14, 1972, in Kuwait, one of the greatest events took place. I was born to my mother. Yay! So this Saturday, I'm going to be 47 years young. Did you know that? Great, one of the greatest dates known to mankind. The only other date that was superior to mine was the birth of the Apostle Paul. I'm talking about human lives, right? Okay, anyway. Now, someone said I'm a kickboxing legend. Guys, let me tell you, let me tell you what an amazing kickboxer I used to be. You guys ready? Honestly, we're going to begin. Say, Christian, you don't look like day over 120. I'm sure you remember your days with Pharaoh and Moses building the pyramids. Okay, here. I used to be one of the most amazing kickboxers the world has ever known. Okay, let me tell you, let me tell you how good I was. Each day, Renee, you gotta hear this, Renee. Each day, honestly, I used to go to the local grocery store and kick every box that I could find all day, all night, and I didn't stop kicking all the boxes. And I became known as the greatest kickboxer the world has ever seen. No one kicked more boxes than me. Okay? <laughs> Dude, don't, listen. Jeff Durbin did what we call ballet dancing. That Taekwondo stuff only works in ballet. And you tell Jeff Durbin I said it anytime. I'll take him out. Okay? But anyway. Now, how many of you heard of Taekwondo so I can begin? People are like, man, we're here to hear. Yeah, but we're waiting. We're warming up. How many of you heard of Taekwondo? Okay. Okay. Now, a lot of people don't know. I wasn't a black belt in Taekwondo, but I did, I did have two black belts. Ninth degree black belt and take one to go and a grandmaster of take your dough. Ninth degree black belt right here of take one to go and grandmaster of take your dough. I'm the highest ranking in these two systems. Okay. Okay. Are we ready now? Sorry. Are you ready? Take your dough and take one to go. All right. Let's begin. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, we praise you. We glorify you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Father, I, I'm aware you don't need me. And I'm not qualified to be speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I mean that. I know that, Father. I know that too well. So my trust is in your Holy Spirit, Lord. All of us trust in your Holy Spirit. We depend on your Holy Spirit. We're in need of your Holy Spirit. We're in love with your Holy Spirit. I'm in love with the Holy Spirit. I adore your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, please fill us with the Spirit. Fill me 
with wisdom, knowledge, understanding of your word from your Holy Spirit. And Father, give us the power of your Holy Spirit, not just to know your word, but to live it, Father. And please help us. Help me. I want to live for you, Father, for Jesus, for, for his glory, by the power of your Holy Spirit. We all want to, Father. They're not here for me. They want to hear from you using me, your imperfect vessel, Father. So anoint my words to speak clearly. Protect me from error and stammering and confusion. Bless them, Father. Cover us by the blood of Jesus. Cover our loved ones with the blood of Jesus. My daughters with the blood of Jesus. And sustain us and save us for your glory. Not to be afraid of anything Satan in the world throws against us, Father. And Father, please anoint this session. <clears throat> Fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the health I need from your spirit to glorify you and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. And please remove the veil to go deep in your word, deep in your word, and live it out for your glory. And we honor the victims of 9-11, Father. Use us to destroy this wicked, evil, antichrist system so that Muslims get saved and find true peace in Jesus Christ, your son, your heart, your love. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. I know, memmy, mem, memmyophobe. I want to keep it very trim, not thick anymore because I look too old. All right? Okay, let's begin. I want to discuss two things today, Lord Jesus willing. Two things today. I want to discuss so called prophecy. Jesus made about Muhammad in order to turn that prophecy against Muslims to show that Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus and Jesus Christ is the God and judge of Muhammad. Okay, that's one. Then with the time remaining, I want to talk about justification, the assurance and the peace we have that because of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a righteous standing before God procured by Jesus Christ given to us as a gift of his grace. And the reason why I want to talk about that is simply these Muslim hijackers. Are you with me here? The Muslim hijackers did what they did because they realized they have no assurance from their God that their deeds would be pleasing enough to merit entrance into what I call the Islamic brothel, the Islamic whorehouse called Jannah. Are you with me there? So they did what they thought their God required of them to guarantee that once they died, they would enter everlasting bliss. And I need your attention here. One of the sure ways, one of the ways that the Quran assures Muslims that they will enter Jannah, paradise. And again, let me, let me call it for what it is. Islamic paradise is a glorified brothel whorehouse. It makes playboy mansion pale by comparison. But one of the ways that Allah has assured the Muslim of his pleasure and granting them Jannah, paradise, this whorehouse, is to kill and be killed in the way of Allah. A marked contrast with our Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation he's given us. This is chapter 9, verse 11 of the Quran, 111. Chapter 9, verse 111. How ironic, right? Chapter 9, 111. It's 911, so this is chapter 9, verse 111. I guess I'm going to have to post it unless... First and last, can you post Quran verses or no? Hold on, let me get there. Okay. Let's see. First and last, okay. Chapter 9, verse 111. Chapter 9, verse 111. Thank you, brother. Thank our brother first and last. He's taking over for Protestant believer because he's not there. How ironic, right? Chapter 9, verse 111. 911. 9111. Sam Price, I don't care about the conspiracy theories. I said that in the beginning. If you want to believe it's an inside job, more power to you. But I'm going to use this in, as an opportunity to talk about the jihadis and why they do what they do. Why they do what they do. See, I knew if we're going to discuss 9-11, we're going to have those people into conspiracy theories, right? I knew it. Conspiracy theories, you see? I knew, I, I knew it. I knew... <laughs> There's nothing I talk about that won't bring controversy. I knew it. All right. Anyway, first and last, are you able to post or not, brother? If you can, I'll just go there. Chapter 9, verse 111. Let me read it. I'll read it. Let's start with the Pictal translation. Lo, 
Allah had bought. Guys, pay attention now. You need to learn and ask the Holy Spirit to help you focus for the glory of Christ. Not focusing on me, but on what the Holy Spirit would have me share with you for the glory of Jesus. Lo, Allah had bought from the believers their lives, their souls. So Allah has purchased the souls of believers. He's purchased their wealth because the garden will be theirs. Notice he's purchased their souls and their wealth in exchange for the garden. That's what he's paying them, the garden. Right? They shall fight in the way of Allah. They shall fight in the way of Allah. Right? And shall slay and be slain. It is a promise which is binding on him in the Torah and the gospel and the Quran. Who fulfilleth his covenant better than Allah? Rejoice then in your bargain that you have made, for this is the supreme tribe. Did you notice? Allah has purchased the souls and the wealth of the Muslims with the garden. His promise is, give me your souls, give me your wealth, and I'll give you the garden. And one of the ways you give me your souls and your wealth is that you fight and kill and be killed in my cause. And the garden is yours. You catch it? Did you catch it? So one of the ways that a Muslim can assure himself of heavenly bliss is to kill and be killed in the way of Allah. And this is why you need to be careful. When a Muslim drives a plane into a building or when a Muslim blows himself up to kill the enemies of Allah, that's not suicide. Don't fall into the trap of the liberal media and the rhetoric of the media because then the Muslim will tell you Islam condemns suicide. Suicide is condemned in Islam. And if a Muslim kills himself, he goes to hell, right? Jahannam. Jahannam. This is not considered suicide. Remember the difference. In Islam, killing yourself isn't the same as using your body as a weapon to kill the enemies of Allah. They make a distinction between someone who stops a bomb and blows himself up as a weapon to kill the kuffar for Allah. That's not suicide. That's martyrdom. Suicide is when I hang myself or take pills because I've checked out of life. I'm tired of life and I'm tired of living. That's suicide in Islam. But when someone blows himself up to kill the kuffar, the enemies of Allah, or someone drives a plane into a building to take with him the kuffar, that's not suicide. Don't call it suicide. But because then you give a weapon in the hands of the Muslim and say, see, the messenger condemned suicide and they, they committed suicide. Therefore, they're condemned. Right? It's not suicide. So why would these 19 Muslim hijackers drive planes into buildings? Because they were convinced and duped by Satan who inspired Muhammad. That if you want to attain heavenly bliss, one of the most sure ways of doing so is to kill and be killed in the way of Allah. That was chapter 9, verse 111. Chapter 9, verse 111. Now, what does it say about the martyrs, the shaheed, those who kill and are killed for Allah and his messenger? Where are they? Chapter 2, verse 154 of the Quran. Chapter 2, verse 154. Okay? I'm going to read it. Follow with me. Write these down. Chapter 2, verse 154. And call not those who are slain in the way of Allah dead. Don't say they're dead. Nay, they are living, only ye perceive not. Who said they're dead? They're alive. You don't perceive it, but they're alive. But alive where? Chapter 3, verses 169 to 171 of the Quran. Chapter 3, verses 169 to 171. Let me read it. Write these down. Chapter 3, verses 169 to 171. Think not of those who are slain in the way of Allah as dead. Nay, they are living. With their Lord, they have provision. With their Lord, they have provision. So they're, they're in Jannah, and their Lord is providing for them. Jubilant are they because of that which Allah hath bestowed upon them of his bounty. Rejoicing. So they're rejoicing. They're jubilant. They're more alive. For the sake of those who have not joined them but are left behind that there shall be no fear come upon them, neither shall they agree. See, now when someone reads this, a Muslim who's been brainwashed and thinking this is the book of Allah, put yourself in the shoes of the jihadists and you read this. Wow, if I'm killed in the way of Allah, there'll be no fear upon me, nor will I grieve. 
They rejoice because of favor from Allah and kindness and that Allah wasteth not the wage of the believers. Wow! Is this what I need to do to be jubilant, to be rejoicing, having no fear, and I won't grieve? Kill and be killed the way of Allah? Sign me up. Do you see? Do you catch it? You understand now why they do what they do? Because if you ask a Muslim, if you die today, will Allah be pleased with you? He'll say, Allahu Alam, only Allah knows. I hope for his mercy. So can you imagine living under that fear and tyranny of not knowing that when you die, God will be pleased with you, not knowing when you die, whether you enter Jannah or you'll have to spend time in hellfire. So then if I come and tell you, well, there is a sure way, a sure way. If your motive, your niyyah is sincere for Allah and his messenger, guarantee of you going to paradise. What is it? Kill the kuffar and be killed. And if you're killed, you have no fear, you have nothing to grieve, you'll be provided for by your God. This is, what's the word I'm looking for? It is hell to live under this kind of pressure. It is hell mentally. It does psychological damage, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. This religion destroys a person inside and out. This religion traumatizes a person inside and out. This religion will cause you mental, emotional, physical sickness. Right? And you see why they need Jesus Christ? Do you see why they need the love of Jesus Christ? Do you see why they need the assurance of Jesus Christ? Do you see why they need to know there is a better way, which is the only way? The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't command you to kill in order to please him. Instead, he came and allowed himself to be killed in your place to give you everlasting life. Right? You see? So this is why the Muslim jihadists do what they do. This is why they believe that the only way I can have assurance, if my intention is sincere before Allah, that I'm not doing it for the praise of men. I'm doing it to make Allah, his, the word of Allah and his messenger supreme. The only way I can have assurance that this God will be pleased with me if I kill and be killed. Otherwise, I live with the fear of never knowing whether Allah will be pleased with me enough. Right? Is that clear? Why they did what they did? So in a way, though we hate them because of how they killed these people, is it them we should hate? Or should we hate Allah and his messenger Muhammad? Because if you are convinced, guys, put yourself in their shoes for a minute. I want you to understand their psychology. If you are convinced this is the true religion, and you're convinced the only way I can escape hell, the torture of hell, the torment of hell, is if I kill and be killed in the way of Allah, then they're only doing what anyone else would do if they're convinced this is the religion of God. If you are convinced this is God's religion, you would have the same attitude. So are they really, are they really the ones we should hate? Or are they the victims of Muhammad, the son of Satan? Because they're convinced there was no better way. Right? So, now with that said, let's expose Muhammad for the Antichrist, son of Satan, that he was, and show he's under the feet of Jesus Christ. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a prophecy, right? I'm going to take a prophecy that Muslims point to as Jesus predicting the coming of Muhammad and turn it against them and prove that Jesus is Muhammad's God that Jesus and the Father are Muhammad's God, his creator and judge. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? I'm going to take one of the Bible passages they pervert to their shame and destruction, turn it against them to prove that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father, and that the Father and the Son together, Father and Son together are Muhammad's God, Muhammad's judge, Muhammad's creator, that they are Allah of the Quran. And then I'm going to prove that this shows 
Muslims shamefully perverted, corrupted the text of the Quran because they added things in the Quran that Muhammad would have never said. Are you ready for that or no? Are you ready now going to the meat? If you're ready, let's begin. According to chapter 61, verse 6 of the Quran, let me set it up. We're going to have fun, Lord willing. Chapter 61, verse 6 of the Quran. Jesus predicted the coming of Ahmed. Chapter 61, verse 6. And when Jesus said to Mary, said, O children of Israel, lo, I am the messenger of Allah unto you. Confirming that which was re revealed before me in the Torah. And bringing good tidings of a messenger, bringing good news, bringing the gospel. See, the Quran says Jesus preached the gospel. But what was the gospel that Jesus preached? What was the gospel that Jesus preached? Here it is. Bringing good news, good tidings, glad tidings, gospel of a messenger who cometh after me, whose name is Ahmad, the praised one. So Muslims believe that the good news of Jesus is that he announced the coming of Muhammad by his other name, Ahmad which ironically appears only in this passage. And Pictal translates Ahmed as the praised one. He doesn't even retain the Arabic form. He translates the meaning of the Arabic. Ahmed means the praised one. And that it itself introduces idolatry, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yet when he hath come unto them with clear proofs, they say this is mere magic. So did you guys catch it, folks? The Gospel of Isa, Ibn Maryam. Jesus, son of Mary, according to the Quran, isn't for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The gospel of Jesus, according to the Quran, is that he announced the coming of Ahmed, another name of Muhammad. Chapter 61, verse 6. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Chapter 61, verse 6. Okay, now, how do we turn this against them? Well, if you're a Muslim and you believe what the Quran said, you're now going to look for a statement from the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to show where Jesus announced the coming of Muhammad, and Muslims think they found it. Muslims think they found it, and irony of ironies. What Gospel they think announces the coming of Muhammad? The Gospel of John. What? The Gospel of John. But isn't that the very Gospel that the Muslims tell us is the least reliable of the four Gospels because it's later in time, more theologically developed, and contains more explicit statements that Jesus is God in the flesh, none of which you can trace back to Jesus because it's not historically reliable. All of a sudden now, this Gospel becomes historically reliable. Did you catch it? You see the irony? Do you see the irony? The Gospel of John is the one Gospel Muslims will always tell you it's the least historically reliable. The things that Jesus says in the Gospel of John, he didn't say it. Even your scholars admit it. John put it in his mouth. He's given us the meaning of Jesus, not the actual words of historical Jesus. It's more theologically developed, later in time, least reliable historically. And yet, all of a sudden, this is the Gospel that now becomes reliable enough to tell us that Jesus announced the coming of Muhammad. Beautiful, right? The consistency of Islam is amazing. Not, right? Now, let's unpack it. They think that in the Gospel of John, when the Lord Jesus Christ announced the coming of the paraclete, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, in John chapters 14 to 16, that is Muhammad, not the Holy Spirit of God. Muhammad. Not the Holy Spirit of God, right? The paraclete. Paraclete. Paracletos. Paracletas, right? Paraclete. Guys, that's the Greek, dude. Chill. Now, this word, paraclete, is variously translated as helper, comforter, counselor. Paracletos means someone called alongside another. Paracletos means someone called alongside another. Meaning, what does that mean? That... This figure comes alongside another to help and assist, right? So they think the statements of our Lord Jesus Christ about the paraclete is a prophecy of Muhammad. So now let's unpack it and turn it against Muhammad, 
proving that these very statements that Muslims are quoting show Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus and Jesus is the God of Muhammad and the Quran is corrupt. Are you ready now? We ready? Okay. Let's go to John 14, verses 16 to 17, if our brother first last is able to post. Yeah. And that, that's true, Abraham Matthew. Michael Jackson is a greater prophet than Muhammad because in one of his songs, he pronounced it prophesied my coming. Shamon, Shamon. He was announcing the coming of Sam Shamon. All right. John 14, 16 to 17. Let's read, folks. Thank first last he's posting. Read with me. Okay, read with me. Here's the prophecy of Muhammad. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, John 14, 16, 17. I don't know why you quoted 26. You, you threw me off. John 14, 16 to 17. Let's read, guys. Post it again, first and last. John 14, 16 and 17. Tom Electronics, you should be burned in hell for being stupid. Please justify why you shouldn't be in hell. John 14, 16 and 17. And I'll pray the Father. Yes, you did actually. Earlier someone posted it. Maybe not you. Read with me. John 14, 16 and 17. Read with me. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. Notice, underline your Bibles. I'm going to ask the Father. The Father is going to give you another comforter. Another paraclete, another, another of the same kind. This comforter is going to be another of a, the same kind, which means before this comforter comes, there is already a comforter there. Understand what another comforter means, meaning there's already a comforter there for another one to come later. So don't forget that. Another comforter that he may abide with you forever. 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. This is supposedly Muhammad, folks. Are you ready? Let's unpack it. Let's unpack what Jesus said. I'm going to ask the Father, and the Father is going to give you another paraclete. Another, alos, alan, paracletan, another of the same kind of paraclete. Guys, you understand the implication of that? If the spirit of truth is another comforter, another paraclete, that means there was a comforter before he showed up, right? Tom Electronics, because only a jerk would ask me a question not related to the topic. You want to get blocked? Keep running your mouth. Okay? Another paraclete means that there is a comforter, a paraclete, already there before this other one shows up, right? Are you catching that before I move on to the next point? Hold on. Essay, we got to send essay back to the Blackstone to kiss it. Hold on. Pretending to be a Christian. Bye bye, essay. Bye bye, Miss American Pie. Joe, my Chevy. Okay. Now, supposedly this is Muhammad. G27. Please go away and get lost. You're a nuisance of the devil, asking me a question not related to the topic. So I'm going to send you on your merry way. Enjoy your block. No one likes to respect rules. Bye-bye, Miss American Pie. All right. Now, follow with me. No, brother, I said 5 p.m. Christian Standard uh, Central Standard Time. 5 p.m. CST. 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But anyway, it's okay, bro. All right, follow with me. Follow with me, guys. How does this passage prove Muhammad is a false prophet and the Quran is corrupt? Number one, Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another paraclete. According to the Quran, write these passages down. According to the Quran, write these passages down. Chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran. Chapter 6, verse 101 of the Quran. Write these down. Chapter 5, verse 18. Chapter 6, verse 101. Chapter 9, verse 30. Write these down. Chapter 9, verse 30. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. These are all passages of the Quran. Chapter 19, verse 88 to 93. Chapter 21, verse 26. 21, verse 26. Chapter 72, verse 3. 
72 verse 3, and I also add chapter 39 verse 4. All of these passages teach Allah is a father to no one. He has no sons in any sense of the term. He's not a spiritual father who has spiritual children, and Jesus is not his son. Chapter 9, verse 30. Jesus is not the son of Allah. Jews and Christians are not the sons of Allah because Allah is not a father in any sense, not just biologically, right? Because the Jews and Christians, time Muhammad, did not believe that God was their father physically, sexually, biologically. They believed God was their father spiritually. Because he's a spiritual being. And Muhammad said, no way. My God is a father to no one. He's not a spiritual father. He's not a metaphorical father. He doesn't have spiritual children. And Jesus isn't his son. Okay, folks, I'm really confused. Chapter 14, verse 16 of the Quran. I'm sorry. God, forgive me for mixing up the true word of God, the gospel of John with the Quran, the book of Satan. Chapter 14, verse 16 of John. Chapter 14, verse 16 of John said that Jesus would pray to the Father and the Father would send another paraclete. How can Muhammad be that paraclete when it's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father who sends him? And the Quran says, Allah is a father to no one. How can Muhammad be that paraclete when the Father sends the paraclete and the Quran says, Allah is the father to no one. Are you with me there? Are you getting this? No side debates or distractions. Focus. Now, if it is Muhammad, if it is Muhammad, that means the Quran has been corrupted. It's not the original teachings of Muhammad. You know why? Because Muhammad, if he's the paraclete, would never deny... That Allah is the Father and Jesus is the Son. Because as the paraclete, he would know it's the Father sending him on behalf of his Son. So Muhammad would never deny it, which means when Muhammad died, the Muslims were so evil, they changed the Quran to make it as if Muhammad denied Allah is the Father and Jesus is the Son. You evil Muslims, how dare you change the message of the paraclete? You get it now? It's okay, Protestant believer. You can post. Let's not debate who's going to post. So, Protestant, go ahead, my brother. You catch it, right? If Muhammad is the paraclete, then Muhammad would have gone around saying, Allah is the father of Jesus. Jesus is the son of Allah. And the father and son together are Allah. They sent me. Therefore... That means these passages of the Quran that say Allah is not the Father, Jesus is not the Son, were never uttered by Muhammad. They were added to the Quran because the Muslims shamefully changed the message of Muhammad. So if he is the paraclete, this proves that the Quran is corrupt. Now, are you ready for more? Is this exciting you or is it boring you? Because I want to hear, be here to serve you, bless you, amaze you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Fadi Haron, can you do me a favor, man? Stop chiming. I'm going to block you. I just said that the Jews and Christians, time Muhammad, would have said that Allah is their father spiritually, not physically. And Muhammad said, no, he's still not your father. Stop chiming in or you're going to get blocked and I'm going to send you to Mecca. Okay. Stop pretending you know what you're talking about, friend, and learn. Now let's come back to the other problem. John 14, 17. Now I know Jonathan Soko is a regular, so he's a, he's on that's right because he's agreeing and not trying to be a nuisance to get me upset because I love this brother not too much. John 14, 17. Master Y. I guess you're not a genius because I'm not going to waste my time on you, but block you and send you on your merry, merry way. Down boy. Down boy. All right. John 14, 17. Let's read. Read with me. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, 
but ye know him. Guys, Jesus says to his disciples, Peter, James, and John, Bartholomew, you know this paraclete. You know him. Why? Because he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Oh, boy. Let's post John 14, 17. One more time. Oh, boy. Focus, guys. Don't let Satan distract you. Pray, Jenny, for me that God will use me for his glory and watch over my daughters and fight for us. John 14, 17. Read with me. The world does not know him because the world doesn't see him. Last time I checked, many people saw Muhammad. But then the last part. But you, my disciples, know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait. If the paraclete is Muhammad, that means Muhammad was already alive about 570 years before his human birth because Jesus says the paraclete is with you now and will be in you. So that means Muhammad is a pre-existent figure who existed before he became flesh. That means Muhammad existed as a spiritual being over 570 700 years before he became a human being. And he was there as a spirit dwelling with the apostles of Christ. So they just proved the pre-human existence of Muhammad. Wow. Wow. So Muhammad was there as a disembodied or as a bodiless spirit. He existed as a spirit creature or a spirit being without a physical body because Jesus says, hey, the paraclete is with you right now. And then later on, he'll be in you, in all of you. Wait, 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 wait. So not only was Muhammad there with Jesus and the disciples, he's now going to indwell a group of human beings at the same time to empower them to carry out the mission that Jesus commands them to carry out. Which means Muhammad now is omnipresent, omnipotent, because he's going to dwell all the apostles at the same time, wherever they're at, to empower them to carry out the mission successfully. So now you just prove Muhammad is a pre-existent being who had a pre-human existence, was alive as a bodiless spirit at the time of Jesus, was with Jesus, and he's omnipresent, omnipotent. So you just made Muhammad a god. Alongside the Father and the Son. <laughs> Therefore, all those passages in the Quran that say Muhammad is just a man, an imperfect man, a sinful man, must have been passages added later on by the Muslims to denigrate Muhammad, who's actually a divine being. Shame on you, Muslims. May Allah damn you. For changing the message of Muhammad, who was a pre-human, pre-existent, bodiless spirit being, who is divine, who existed with Jesus, and, and dwelt the apostles, and empowered the apostles. You changed all that to make him nothing more than a human being like you did with Jesus. Why, you unbelieving, wicked Sons and daughters of Satan, how dare you demote Muhammad to the level of a human creature? You did to Muhammad what you did to Jesus. Wow. You corrupted his message, corrupted his Quran to make him appear as if he's just an imperfect, sinful, wicked human being. And you did the same with Jesus when Muhammad is a divine being who preached that Jesus is his God with the Father. See what happened here? Evil, wicked Muslims. How dare you change the, the message of Muhammad, the paraclete, who is a divine preexisted being who became flesh. You see what I just did? Before I move on to the next point. Saw what I just did, right? Okay. 
But let's go to John 14, 26, and I'll unpack the meaning of these passages. John 14, 26. John 14, 26. What's going to get better, folks? But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now notice, here we're even told he's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And the Father will send him in my name. And who is he going to teach? He's going to remind the disciples of what Jesus said to them. Jesus saying to Peter, James, John, Philip, hey, when the Holy Spirit comes, the Comforter, he's going to remind you of what I said, which again proves that the paraclete was there and would come in the lifetime of the apostles. So now again, let's say it's Muhammad. Follow with me, guys. Let's say it's Muhammad. This again proves Muhammad was there with Jesus, and he was there with the apostles, and he taught the apostles what Jesus was teaching them while he was with them on earth. He reminded them of the teachings of the apostle, of Jesus. He reminded them of the teachings of Jesus. So Muhammad is already there, present and active with the apostles, sent by the Father in the name of Jesus, and he's the Holy Spirit. This again proves that Islamic theology is corrupt because Islamic theology tells me the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel. If Muhammad is the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, then how can the Holy Spirit be Gabriel when the Muslims just proved Muhammad is the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the paraclete? You with me there? Jesus just said the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the paraclete, he's the Holy Spirit. Muslims say Muhammad is the paraclete. That means Muhammad is the Holy Spirit. But then they're telling me the Holy Spirit is Gabriel. Are you telling me that Muhammad is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Gabriel? So that Muhammad is the human appearance of Gabriel? So Muhammad is the angel Gabriel in the flesh? Really? So now, not only did you prove Muhammad was existing before he was born from his mother, was already in existence at the time of Jesus and the apostles and was there as a bodiless spirit being, which is why the world could not see him because he was invisible. He didn't have a body. He existed as a bodiless spirit being, a spirit being who's omnipresent, omnipotent, who's called the Holy Spirit, which Islamic theology tells me is Gabriel, so that Muhammad was there as this divine bodiless spirit being who is actually angel Gabriel, which means angel Gabriel is a divine spirit being, and that when this spirit being became flesh, he took on the identity of Muhammad. So Muhammad is the Holy Spirit slash angel Gabriel in the flesh. So Muhammad is the incarnation of the Holy Spirit slash angel Gabriel. Hmm. Wow. Are you with me there? You see how easy it is to destroy, decimate, obliterate Muhammad and his God by the power of the triune God? Because our God is true, Jesus is alive. You see how easy it is to destroy this religion? Right? And is anyone confused or you're getting it? If anyone's confused, tell me I'm confused or put it too. Or you're getting it. Exactly, Von V's. Okay. Now remember John 14, 26 stated, The Father will send the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, in my name. In my name. John 15, 26. Okay, Protestant, you the man, baby. <laughs> John 15, 26. Exactly, Jehan, they do. Okay. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. Oh, boy, I'm really confused. 
Jesus says, I will send the comforter, the spirit of truth, from the Father, who proceeds from the Father out of heaven. I'm going to send him. So notice what Jesus says. Father and I together will send the comforter, spirit of truth, from the Father out of heaven in my name. Wow. So that means Muhammad doesn't originate from the earth. Muhammad originates from the Father in heaven. And when Jesus returned to heaven, he then sent Muhammad from the Father in heaven to come to the apostles of Jesus in the name of Jesus, to speak of Jesus and glorify Jesus. John 16, 14 and 15. John 16, 14 and 15. Watch here. Sam Price, ask me that a little later. I don't want to change subjects. If I answer when did the Holy Spirit come, that's going to go off topic. Just be patient and focus. Okay. John 16, 14 and 15. He, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the comforter, counselor, helper, paraclete, shall glorify me. So he will glorify Christ. He shall Receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Whatever belongs to the Father belongs to me. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it, show it unto you. So the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, will convince the apostles and the world everything that the Father owns belongs to the Son, Jesus Christ. He will convince you everything that the Father owns belongs to the Son, Jesus Christ. Well, last time I checked, the entire creation belongs to the Father. And Jesus says, I own whatever the Father possesses. Whatever belongs to the Father is mine. I own it. That means Jesus owns the heavens and the earth. Jesus owns everything in the heavens and the earth. Jesus owns all spirit creatures in heaven and owns every creature on earth. He owns the plants. He owns the trees. He owns the sun. Stars, moon, the sea animals. He owns every human being. He owns every Muslim. He owns every land. He owns all Muslim lands. He owns everything. And Jesus owns Muhammad. Right? Let's look at it again. John 16, 14 and 15. One more time so you can see it. He owns everything in the entire creation. Everything that the Father has belongs to the Son. Read it. He, the paraclete, shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. They're mine. I own them. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So now. Jesus says in John 15, 26, in John 16, 14 and 15, he said, the paraclete will glorify me. I will send him from the Father because he proceeds from the Father out of heaven. So I and the Father together send the paraclete from the Father's presence in heaven. And the Father sends him in my name to glorify me and reveal to you and convince you I own everything that belongs to the Father. Well, the Quran tells me Allah sent Muhammad in the name of Allah to glorify Allah and to testify that everything belongs to Allah. Allah sent Muhammad in the name of Allah. And you see that in the Quran, right? Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious. So right there, in the name of Allah. So Muhammad proclaims in the name of Allah, was sent in the name of Allah to glorify Allah and to convince people everything belongs to Allah. But Jesus said, the Father and I, the Son, will send the paraclete from the Father in my name, on my behalf, for my sake. He'll glorify me and convince everyone everything belongs to me. Hold on. If the paraclete is Muhammad, paraclete is Muhammad, and Allah sent Muhammad in the name of Allah to glorify Allah and convince everyone we all belong to Allah. And yet the paraclete is going to convince the world the Father and the Son sent the paraclete in the name of the Son to glorify the Son and convince the world everything belongs to the Son. 
that means the father and the son have to be Allah, the God of Muhammad. So that means when Muhammad spoke of Allah, came in the name of Allah, glorified Allah, he was actually glorifying the father and son as Allah, his God. You with me there? You think you understand what happened here? But the Quran says Allah is not the father. Jesus isn't the son. This is more proof that these Muslims are so wicked and evil. They changed the message of Muhammad because Muhammad went around saying Allah is the father and the son. Jesus is the son of Allah and he is Allah. And the Father and Son are my God, Allah, and I glorify Jesus the Son, and everything belongs to him, even me. But the Muslims came and changed the message of the Quran. So in the Quran, they have Muhammad saying, Allah is not the Father, Jesus isn't a Son. Shame on you wicked Muslims for changing the message of Muhammad, who's the paraclete. Allah is going to damn you for that. You see what happened now? <laughs> You see the nightmare? So don't get upset when they quote the Gospel of John. Say, oh, wait, wait, wait. So you just quoted John, right? So you believe these are the words of the historical Jesus, right? What's up, Brother Al? Good to see you. Pray for me, brother. Lord willing, October, I'm going to start a new chapter there. We're going to do Bible studies. And hopefully you'll come and join me. And God will bring the increase for his glory in Jesus' name. So, Sadi Qani Qabinati. The Lord set me free to glorify him. All right. So now, follow with me. Follow with me here. Guys, follow with me. Understand what we just proved. If the Muslims want to say the paraclete is Jesus, prophecy of Muhammad, the paraclete is Jesus' prophecy of Muhammad, then they're admitting that these are the words of the historical Jesus in the Gospel of John. Then... When you quote the Gospel of John to show that Jesus claimed to be God, and they tell you, well, you can't trust John because John is not reliable. He comes later, more theologically developed, and he's putting words in the mouth of Jesus. Tell them, but wait, you quoted John. You said that in John, the historical Jesus prophesied the coming Muhammad, which means you admit that John is giving you the actual words of the historical Jesus. So now why... When I quote the same John to show the historical Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh, one with the Father, now you question its historical reliability. If John is good enough to prove your point, he's good enough to expose Muhammad and condemn him as an antichrist. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Right? So we just buried this lie that Muhammad is the paraclete. But now let me explain the theological implications of the paraclete passages. Let me explain the theological implications of the paraclete passages. Are you ready to do some in-depth study and go into the meat? You ready for the meat now? We just destroyed Muhammad as an antichrist by the power of the true God, the triune God, from his true word, the Holy Bible. Okay, now let's un un unpack the theological implications of these prophecies because I don't want to focus on Muhammad right now. I want to focus on the meaning of the paraclete. And the Lord forgive me for even identifying Muhammad as a paraclete. That is one of the most evil and wicked and blasphemous things you could ever say, that this son of Satan Muhammad was the paraclete. Lord forgive me. I just used it for argument's sake. May God destroy such blasphemy and erase Muhammad's memory from the earth so Muslims get saved and fall in love with Jesus. Right? Let's go back to John 14, 17. Right? I get sick even saying Muhammad is a paraclete. I get disgusted. Right? Okay. John 14, 17. You pray that the Spirit will anoint me with such wisdom and power to know the word so that he will blow our minds through the preaching of the word and give us the power to live it for the glory of Christ. Yep, I'm going to need a shower, Jonathan, no lie. John 14, 17, let's unpack it. Guys, read the passage. Let's bring out its theological import, its significance and importance. Even the spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Why? Because the Holy Spirit doesn't have a bodily shape. The Spirit is bodiless, shapeless by nature. So he's invisible to the human eye. But he can appear visibly if he wants to. But notice what Jesus said. The world does not see him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and shall be in you. Let's unpack that. Number one, the spirit like the father and the son by nature is bodiless. By nature is shapeless. By nature is formless, timeless, spaceless. Why? Because the Spirit is one with the Father and the Son. And as the one God, He exists before time, space, and place. Because the Father, the Son, and the Spirit created all time, space, and place. So the Father, Son, and Spirit exist before there was time, space, and place. Which means by their very nature, Father, Son, and Spirit is spaceless. He doesn't need space. Placeless, doesn't need place. Shapeless, formless. With me there? That's true of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. However, because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God Almighty, created all shape, all form, all space and place, Father, Son, and Spirit can assume any shape and form and enter time and not be bound by any of it. So the Father can assume a shape. The Son can assume a shape and then took on an actual shape when he became human. The Spirit can take a shape by which you can see that visible form, a form in which God is signifying to you, you're looking at me in a form of some kind. Because you can't see me, because I'm invisible by nature, I'll appear visibly so you can see that form that I will manifest so that you'll know that I'm God standing before you. Is that clear? Medic got it. Is that clear? Let me prove to you that the spirit who is invisible by nature, shapeless by nature, can assume a form. John 1, 32. So let's back, unpack the meat. John 1, 32. John 1, 32. Yep, France, exactly. And John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. See, I saw him visibly. I saw the Spirit like a dove, and it abode upon him, Christ. Did you catch it? I, John the Baptist, saw the Spirit visibly come down like a dove. Luke 3, 22. I may only have time for this, right? Let's see. I may be able to go into justification. Luke 3, 22. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove. Jesus is Lord, Lord bless you, but we have Protestant believer posting, so thank you. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape, so appeared bodily, he appeared in a shape that resembled a dove upon Jesus, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. So even though the world cannot see the Spirit because he's invisible, the Spirit can appear visibly in a form, a form that he doesn't possess by nature because he's formless. But that form he can assume so that you can see, oh, there's God. That form is a shape that God is assuming so I can see him with my eyes. Right? That's the first thing you learn. learn. Good, Christian princess. That's confirmation of the spirit to you that you're seeing something from God because it agrees with the Bible. Okay, now. Let's go back to John 14, 17. Medic, you can make a strong case that the three persons that appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18 was the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit appearing as three men. I'll do a session on that in the future, Lord willing. Okay. 
Notice the last part again. John 14, 17. Jesus says, the spirit dwells with you and shall be in you. The spirit dwells with you and shall be in you. Now, Jesus said, you disciples know the spirit already because he's dwelling with you. How was the spirit dwelling with them? How was the spirit dwelling with the apostles? He's dwelling with you now, but then shall be in you. How was the spirit dwelling with the apostles? Jesus said he's already here with you. He's dwelling with you. How was he dwelling with them? In what sense? Help me out, guys. Focus, Weister and everyone. Focus. In what way, in what sense was the Spirit dwelling with them? No, he's not in them, Asher. He said he will be in you later. Not in their heart, mind, and soul. You're not listening, medic. Read it. He dwells with you but will be in you. He's not in them yet. Cheryl and Charles got it because he came upon Jesus. He remained on Jesus, was working through Jesus. John 1, 32 to 33. Not upon them, no. Upon him. The Spirit came down, was upon Jesus, in Jesus, working through Jesus. John 1, 32 to 33. Watch here. And John bear record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him, him. And I knew him not. I didn't know who Jesus was. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So the spirit came down visibly on Christ as a sign from this moment on, I'm working with the Son, working through the Son, working in the Son. The Son and I work together to accomplish God's will on earth. Mark 1.10. Mark 1.10. Mark 1.10. I'm going to show you something interesting about Mark 1.10. Let me show you something interesting. Mark 1, 10. One second. Let me get you the interlinear so you can read it so you know I'm not lying. Right? Okay. Mark 1, 10. Okay. Now, Mark 1, 10. And straightway coming up out of the water. Pedro, my brother, don't post for me, please. Protestant is doing it for us. Thank you. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the, hears, the heavens open, and the Spirit like a dove descended upon him. Descending upon him. Go to th this link. Click this link. The preposition used is ace. Ace. It doesn't use epi. The preposition epi means upon or on. Here, Mark uses the preposition ace. Check it out. Compilation Madness, if you repeat again, Jesus 27 is a Christian. This is the 10th time you repeat it. I'm going to block you too. Do it again. Make my day. Do it again. Okay. Click on the link. Yeah, I'm going to give you mad love in a minute. Click on the link and see the preposition is ace. Do you see it? Ace. That's the preposition that means into. Right? You have another preposition, in. In, which means in, right? Ace means into. So one way of translating the preposition is the Holy Spirit came into him. Into him. Exactly, Sam Price. You with me there? The word for upon or on is epi. Now, we don't want to get too literal with the prepositions. Because even when you say upon or into or in, you have to explain what does it mean for the Holy Spirit who's immaterial to be upon you, in you, into you, or working through you. So again, and prepositions can be used synonymously, right? Interchangeably. But 
Here you see the, the preposition is ace. Do you guys see that? Did you click on the Greek and see it? I'm not making it up. You guys saw it? Okay, so right there, ace can mean into. The Holy Spirit came into him. So he wasn't simply on him. He was in him, indwelling his physical body and working through him. Ray Brewster, I think what sin is that your mother gave birth to a filthy dog, scum lowlife like you. She should be thrown in jail for giving birth to a dog, a filthy scum dog like you for the language you use. Now, people are wondering why I'm cussing him out. He just asked me about oral sex because that's what his mother taught him. All right. You with me there? So uh, one way of translating Mark 1.10, Mark 1.10. Is the Holy Spirit came into Jesus. You understand the implication? The Holy Spirit came into Jesus. Everyone got it? So, when Jesus says, you know the Spirit because he's with you, it's because the Holy Spirit was there indwelling Jesus, operating through Jesus. Emily, what I think is a serious discussion is that you're a filthy prostitute of Satan who make your father proud because you're a filthy pig for saying he's asking me a, a serious question. You wicked prostitute of Satan. And I'm giving you the G-rated because Christian's going to get upset at me for calling you a prostitute. I don't mean to insult prostitutes. Okay? Sorry, guys. The daughters and sons of Satan are coming out. And they don't know me very well. They think I'm a nice guy like James White, my brother. No, I'll stoop to your level. I'll get in the mud and bury you in your mud. I'm just as dirty as you, you filthy slime and prostitutes of the devil. <laughs> we love you, Jesus. All right. Anyway, ready? Yeah, they manifest when I teach. It's okay, Sam. I want to teach them a lesson that when they come here, they're going to get insulted, and I'm going to cuss them out. Right? And humiliate them and their mother. God didn't make me an Assyrian Jew for nothing. All right. All right. So now, when Jesus said to the apostles, he is already with you. Right? And will indwell you. What he meant was, the spirit is here. He's active. He's in me, working through me. He's using my physical body to work through. In other words, when Jesus is on earth, he and the Spirit were working together 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You with me there? Let's go to Luke 4, verse 1, for confirmation of this from the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 4, verse 1. Luke 4, verse 1. It's going to get even more beautiful, Lisa. I'm going to blow you away even more. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. You see it? Filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, working with the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, 14. Exactly, Mimeo, phobe. Luke 4, 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. By the power of the Holy Spirit, indwelt by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. Right? Luke 4, 18. No, in these passages, it's the Holy Spirit. It's not Paraclete. It's not. Paraclete's not used here. Luke 4, 18. Uh, Pendo, who told you my anger is leading me to sin? If you say something stupid, I'm going to block you too. I'm not sinning. I am giving people the taste of their medicine, answering a fool according to his folly, and burying him in his own filth and mud, which is biblical. Don't you ever accuse me of sinning in my righteous anger. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Oh, so now he's upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So the Holy Spirit is upon him. The Holy Spirit is in him, entered into him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, right? 
He has the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus and the Spirit are working together 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yep, he's quoting Isaiah 61.1. Now, Matthew 12, 28. Yes, friends, Tom, Toma, he could. Jesus could have done miracles before that time because he's still God in the flesh, but chose to wait until the appointed time where the Spirit would join him in ministry. Matthew 12, 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So Jesus did miracles by the Spirit of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit was on him. The Holy Spirit entered into him, right? So you see what Jesus meant when he told the disciples, he's already with you, and you know he's with you, because the miracles are a sign he's working through me, because he's in me. I'm with him. We're in fellowship, right? You got it? Okay, but wait, let me show you something else. John 10, 37 and 38. John 10, 37 and 38. Alice, there is no Alice Kale. Your mother doesn't exist. It was a bunch of dogs that gave birth to you, a female dog, but they implanted memories that made you think you're a human, but you're a filthy female dog of Satan. John 10, 37, 38. John 10, 37, 38. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. Now notice 38. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. Wow. The father was on earth. The Holy Spirit was on earth. Father and spirit together were on earth, working in and through the physical body of Jesus. Believe the miracles. It's the Father who's in me right now with the Spirit in me right now doing miracles with me. We're all together on earth. John 14, 7. John 14, 7 to 11. Exactly. Fire, Darius. Fire. Fire. John 14, 7, 11. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. From henceforth you know him and have seen him. Man, you're seeing the Father. When you look at me, you're seeing the Father. Not because Jesus is the same person as the Father. But when you see me, you're looking at the Father. Because right now as I'm speaking to you, guess who's in this body with me? The Father is with me. Guess who's in this body with me? The Holy Spirit. So when you see me, you're looking at the Father and the Spirit because they're together in this body working through me. Right? You have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, the Father in me? The words I speak unto you, I speak not. <clears throat> I speak not <clears throat> of myself, but the Father dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Do you see what he said? Guys, what are you talking about? The miracles I'm doing, that's the Father in me doing them. The miracles I'm doing, that's the Holy Spirit in me doing them. So what do you mean, show us the Father? Look at me, you're seeing the Father. Because the Father is in me right now. The Spirit is in me right now. I'm not the Father, I'm not the Spirit, but they're here in this body of mine, using my body, working with me, and using my body to do these miracles. Exactly, medic. The Father, Son, and Spirit together are doing the miracles on earth using the flesh body of Jesus as their physical vehicle. You catch it?
You got it or no? The Father's in me doing the works. Believe the miracles that he's in me. The Holy Spirit is already with you. And this is the same chapter in John 14, 17, later where he says, the Spirit is with you. Same chapter, John 14, the Father's in me. He's doing the miracles. The Spirit is with you because he's in me doing the miracles, and I'm with you. You know what Jesus was telling them? Guys, don't you know the whole Godhead is on earth right now with you? Peter, James, John, the Father is now with you. The Spirit is now with you when I am with you because where I go, they follow. I bring the Father and the Spirit to mankind. I connect you to the Father and Spirit. When I'm on earth, you're connected to them because they're with me working in and through me. Before I move on, is it sinking in? It's not because he's the Father. He's not. It's not because the Holy Spirit. He's not. But he's always in perfect union with them. They are in perfect union with him. And on earth, they didn't remain absent from the Son. They were active in and through the Son, using the physical body of the Son in union with the Son to do the works. So one breath you can say the Father did the works. In another breath you can say the Spirit did the works. In another breath you can say the Son did the works because all of them together were doing the works. Do you know the only time, the only time in which the Father and the Spirit were not working through the body of Christ? There is a time in which they were not working through him. Do you know when? When he was handed over to be killed. That's when the Father and the Spirit hands over the Son to die in our place and experience God forsakenness. Did you know that? Do you understand what I just said? That's the time. Yeah, you guys are going to move me in my heart. <clears throat> you got to move me. That's the time when the Father's Spirit hands over the Son for judgment to experience God forsakenness in our place. That's when their hearts broke. That's when the Father and the Spirit, their hearts shattered. Because for a moment in time, they had to hand the son over to judgment and allow him to experience God forsakenness. It happened when he was handed over to be crucified. It started in the garden. Right? When you see it from this perspective, when you see it from this perspective, it wasn't just the son who was shattered. The heart of the Father and the heart of the Spirit were shattered as well. Shattered as well. Because for the first time in their eternal reality, the Godhead had to experience broken intimacy and fellowship. And the Father and the Spirit had to hand over the Son to God forsakenness, the one they love and adore more than anything else. Right? Why do you think, if you want me to now go a little deeper, let me just show you John 15, 26, and I'll go a little deeper, and I'll end it with this. No, Sam Price, come on, man. Why would you say God forsakenness means Jesus isn't God? Come on, brother. You're smarter than this. Jesus isn't God who forsook himself. When I say God forsakenness, I'm talking about the Father and the Spirit. Who told you that Jesus stopped being God? You're talking about a different spirit, Fadi Haron. Please stop confusing yourself. The spirit of Jesus isn't the Holy Spirit. It's his own spirit that animated his human body. Sorry.
Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah, we got another vicious, vile, raby dog of Satan saying emotion when I'm quoting scripture. Another filthy dog that needs to be uh, muzzled. All right, Sam, let me explain it to you very easily. Are you ready, Sam? Sam, are you ready to, for me to explain it to you? Can I explain it to you now? Are you there? Do you have a son or a daughter, Sam? Do you have a son or a daughter? I'm asking Sam, not you, Lewis. I know you're excited. He's angry. Sane's getting angry. Sane's getting angry. We plead the blood of Jesus. Notice when I'm going into the heart of the matter, it's buffering in Jesus' name. All right. Sam, you have a four-month-old boy. Okay. Imagine your son grows up, becomes rebellious. Hey, friend, I think the internet connection is going bad. Yep. Satan, friend. Satan. Satan's getting angry. We plead the blood of Jesus. Yeah, that's Satan. Don't, don't be surprised. He's getting angry. Okay, Sam, can you hear me now? Yep. You can hear me? Okay. Sam, do you want to make sure he's hearing me? Okay, Sam, are you there? I got to hear you. Come on, Sam. Is it okay now? Come on, Sam. I need you, man. Don't lose me, guy. You there? Okay, Sam, your son grows up to be a young man. Your son does something to break your heart and upset you. You yell at him, you rebuke him, you punish him, and you banish him to his bedroom and tell him you don't want to see him for the whole day until the morning. Now, does that mean he stops being your son? He stops being human just because you broke fellowship with him? He stopped being your son. He stopped being human just because he broke fellowship with him. So then why would you assume that Jesus stops being God and the son of God just because the father and the spirit forsook him in judgment for a moment in time? Why would that make him less God or stop him from being the son? How does that follow according to your logic? So can a father be angry with a child and discipline a child with the child still being his son and still live in the same house? Jose Morales, so you ask me that question again, I'm going to block you. Are you with me, Sam Price? Thank you, Al. You know that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. He gets the glory. Keep praying for me to grow. Sam, it's like ask me the question, if you separate from your son, does that make him a separate human being? Now, in that analogy, he is. Why would you again assume, this is where you're confusing me, what does separation from the son, make, how does that follow that he's a separate God? Why are you assuming there's a physical separation as if God is made of body parts or he's like a pie, you cut him into three parts, and when you take one part away, it's a separate pie now. What are you talking about? God is a spiritual being. Why are you defining separation as a physical act where you divide God into pieces and you can divide them? What are you talking about, Sam? Are you with me there? Are you taking it as a physical separation? So here, here's a cup. Oops, I separated the lid from the cup. Now they're separate. Who told you that's what it means for God to separate? In fact, here's where I get frustrated again, folks. And it's not with Sam. You know I'm getting angry? That the church is not doing its job educating Christians about theology. These pastors are a joke. May the Lord rebuke them for failing to teach the flock. Okay, okay let, let's try this again. Sam, when God separates himself from you and damns you to hell, is God physically separate from you in hell? 
My name's not Sham. Don't insult me. See, it takes too long for me to make a point because of the level of biblical illiteracy because the churches have failed in their job. That's why I'm doing this, Sam. I'm speaking out to get your attention, and I'm here to serve you because I love you. But listen to me. Assume you're in hell, God forbid. That means you've been separated from God. What does it mean that you're separated from God in hell? That means God is not there. God is not there. There is no way for you to be separate from God in the sense that God will place you somewhere where he's not present in some sense. God is omnipresent. The entire creation is present before him. He oversees every part of creation. Even hell is present before him. He's even active in hell and sustaining hell. Revelation 14.10, we are told people in hell will be tormented in the presence of Christ. So there isn't a place that you can go, even hell, where God is not present in some sense. Revelation 14.10. The same will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, Revelation 14, 10, which is poured out with mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of lamb, the Lamb. But wait, I thought hell is separation from God. It is. But how can he be separated from God if God's presence is in hell overseeing the torment and God is sustaining hell? So what does it mean, Sam, for God to be separate from sinners? And that hell is a place where you're separated from God. Mean God is not there? He's not present? You got it now. You have a good teacher who taught you well. Glory to the Holy Spirit. Fadi, don't fall for this birthday. There's someone trying to distract being used of the devil. Who cares about his birthday? So, Sam, what does it mean? What does it mean? That those in hell are separated from God. We're talking about something serious. This guy wants to talk about his birthday. Why don't you give me your address and I'll send you a Target gift card. No, but answer. You didn't get it. You didn't answer. What does it mean, Sam? What does it mean? Come on, Sam. I got to make sure you're getting it so I can move to the next point. We're taking too long on this point. Exactly, Doha. Okay. But Sam, you still didn't answer the question, friend. Don't make me ask it a third time and waste time. Sam, now you're you're now disrespecting me. Let me try it again. What does it mean that you are separated from God when you're in hell? You still didn't answer the question, Sam. Please don't disrespect me. Answer the question. I'm taking time to help you answer directly. Yajil, you got it. You got it, Yajil. Christian princes, you got it. Al Darius, you got it. Separated from God means what? I want him to answer. He said he got it. So then you got it. Okay, thank you, Sam. So why are you having a problem? Well, how can Jesus be separate from Father and Son, meaning in fellowship, and still be one God. I just told you what it means. Broken fellowship doesn't destroy the relationship, the way they relate to one another. Any more than when you break fellowship with your son means he's no longer your son. He's no longer your son because you're not in fellowship with him. So why would broken fellowship mean that Jesus somehow has to be a separate God, but he's no longer the son of the father and one with the spirit? Are you with me there now? No, how can Jesus be separated from himself? He's not two persons. Just like you can be angry with your son, upset with your son, not speaking to your son, and banish your son to his room and not see him all day, but he's still your son. That relationship doesn't change. He's still your son. Why can't the Father and the Spirit break fellowship with the Son Without this implying, he's somehow no longer the son or some separate God out there. Why? Why?
Are you getting it now? Oh, my goodness. Sam, I think you got to go, brother. You need to go. So God can separate from man in fellowship and still be their God and man still be his creature. But if the Father and the Spirit break fellowship with the Son, the Son has to stop being the Son and he has to be a separate God. Sam, you got to go, man. No, seriously, you got to go. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, man. All right. This is too much for you. It's not for you, brother. You're not ready for this. Yeah, there's some people you can't. It's too much, so it's better. All right. So let me let me explain the fallacy here. God can break fellowship with man without this stopping God from still being the God of that person and that man still being a creature of God. But somehow, if the son experiences broken intimacy with the Father and the Spirit, somehow that means the son is no longer the son and he's a separate God. Does anyone see what's wrong with that logic? If you're a babe in Christ, don't ask questions and go somewhere else because this is going to be too intense. I'm sorry. Okay, is that clear now? I'm going to repeat. I'm not here to tickle ears, nor am I here, right? Nor am I here to be unnecessarily offensive. But if, you, if you're not getting it, then I can't make you see. And if you're a stupid, barking, rabid dog like life is good, then I'm going to muzzle you, right? All right, hold on. So let's try this again. For those of you who have ISIS in your sphere, if you're angry with your child and you chasten your child and you banish your child to the room and do not see your child for the whole day, does that mean he's no longer your child? She's no longer your child and you stop being their parent? No longer your parent? Okay. Second analogy. If God is upset with a human being and damns that human being to hell, does that mean God is no longer the God of that human being and the human being is not his creature made in his image? Okay. Thirdly, if God sends someone to hell and separates from that person in hell, do we mean that God is no longer present in hell or that hell is not present before him so that he's sustaining hell to punish evildoers? Or by separation, meaning we mean though God is there, he's not there in fellowship. He's not there in communion, but there in anger and wrath. Okay, so now let's come back to Christ. Why is it a problem for Jesus to be separated from the Father and the Spirit in the sense that now as part of the penalty of sin, the fellowship he enjoys between the Father and the Spirit is broken without this implying that Jesus is still the Son, because he still is, without this implying that Jesus is still one in essence with the Father and the Spirit, he still is, without this implying that somehow this makes Jesus a separate God. What's the problem? Is there any problem? Not all Christians believe that, by the way. Some Christians think he, there was no broken fellowship. I don't agree with them. I think the Bible is quite clear. So you got it, right? Now, honestly, how many of you got it? Put a one. If you're still confused, put a two. What's well, clear, right? So Jesus can experience separation from the Father and the Holy Spirit without this implying that he's no longer the Son, he's no longer God, no longer one with them in essence, right? Right? Thank you, you know. All right. So that, I just want to make clear because I, I'm sorry. Let me repeat again. I am not the Holy Spirit. God forbid to even say that is sin because I'm not. It's the Holy Spirit who makes people see. If you can't see, leave it alone. I can't make you see. And maybe you need to go to another person to teach you because like i've said i want to say it again i know people aren't going to like me tough luck man what can i do may god change me to become more humble and gracious may he destroy my pride lord have mercy on me 
I'm a work in project process. Forgive me, Lord. Have mercy on all of us. Every teacher has issues. Okay. God has raised up different teachers with different personalities and temperaments to draw certain people. My type of teaching, my personality is not going to draw everyone. It's going to offend people. I know this. You may be drawn to James White, our brother in Christ, or David Wood, or Anthony Rogers, or Edward Dalcor. Go to someone that you feel the Spirit is using to teach you. I am not God's gift to the church, and God doesn't need me. And there are teachers much better than me that I can't hold a candlestick to, like Edward Dalcor. And I'm being honest. So if God is using me to bless you, amen. But understand, every teacher has issues, imperfections. That you need to be gracious enough to pray that God will heal that person, deliver that person from those issues, and tolerate it for the sake of the Lord so you can benefit from the gift. But if this person is not doing it for you, find someone else. Honestly, I'm not going to be offended. Find someone else. Hey, it was never you, Eva. It was never you, Eva. How you doing? Good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Now that I've taken 20 minutes, and I hope I didn't waste your time, I hope you still got the point. I hope you still got the point. What was the point? Because we got lost because Sam Price just didn't get it. Okay. Here is the point. What you just read in the Gospel of John and in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Father and the Spirit indwelt the Son, were present in the Son, working through the Son's physical body, so that Jesus on earth had the Father and the Spirit working with him, in him, and through his physical body. Did you get that much? Amen, Yajil Pitting. You may never come back, Yajil. That's fine. Did you get the point? And then I said, and then I said, the only time where the Father and the Spirit were not working in and through the physical body of Christ is when he was handed over to be crucified. And then I was going to demonstrate that to every one of you. But I don't know if I have time because my time, I don't know. If you want me to do it? Do you want me to show you? At the cross, the Father and the Spirit had to break fellowship as part of the punishment that the Son endured on our behalf. Are you sure you want to see this? How many of you want to see this? I don't care. It's your time. It's already two hours, and people already complain. Well, you get distracted. You go on tangents. You rebuke people. What do you want me to do? It's a live stream, and I want interaction because I want to make sure people are getting it. Right? Let's finish it then. You ready then? Remember, John's gospel is a spiritual gospel. Things happen physically to point to spiritual realities. So now... Give me your ears, John 19, 28. Give me your ears and focus. Compilation, I'm not technically savvy. I need volunteers to help me build up my YouTube page and break it down to smaller segments for the glory of Christ. So pray for that. Pray for the support. Pray that I continue ministry if the Lord wants to. Okay, John 19, 28. But read now, compilation. John 19, 28. After this, pay attention to the language. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. Notice when he says these, these words. Notice the timing of our Lord. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now the people there thought he is thirsting for something physical. Thank you, friends. Pay attention here, friends. Watch this. Something physical. So 1929, they give him something to drink. But is it a coincidence that Jesus said, I thirst, after he realized he had accomplished redemption? What was he thirsting for? Well, let's go to John 4, 10 and 13 of 14. John chapter 4, verse 10 and 13 of 14. Pay attention now. This is where you got to really pay attention. Come on now. Listen, because I'm going to prove it. John 4, 10 and 13 and 14. John chapter 4, verse 10 and verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, 
Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. See, he would have gave you living water. Now, 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39. Watch here. Watch where we're going with this. Okay, watch here. He that believeth, Jesus speaking, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit. Notice, the living waters is the Holy Spirit indwelling you, quenching your thirst spiritually. Jesus says, if you come to me, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit who will satisfy you spiritually. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. John 6, 35. John 6, 35. Christian princes, you got it. I'm going to prove it. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Did you catch in John 7, 38, 39? Jesus said, this spring of living water that will bubble within you is the Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit. Did everyone get that? Medic, be patient, brother. You're already rushing me. You're not being patient. Lord Jesus, protect you, mustard seed, and all your inhabitants. Okay. Now, watch here. It's the impatience of Christians that kill me. Watch here. And I thought I was impatient. Why would Jesus need to give you the Holy Spirit to satisfy you spiritually if you already have the Holy Spirit to begin with? In other words, why don't we have the Holy Spirit? Why do we need to be given the Holy Spirit? Why don't you already have the Holy Spirit? Why do you need to be given the Holy Spirit? Why do you need to be given the Holy Spirit if you already have it? Think about it. He has to give you the Holy Spirit. It means you don't have it. The living water is the Holy Spirit that satisfies and quenches you. Why does he need to give it to you if we have it? it means we don't have it. So why don't we have it? Come on now. Why don't we have it? Why am I not born with the Holy Spirit and dwelling me and satisfying me? King of kings got it because of sin. Because of sin, we are not born with the Holy Spirit, the living waters. Because, well, again, Pedro, that's not an answer to the question. Why do I need to accept Jesus to receive it if I have it from birth? Because of sin. Being born in sin, being conceived in sin makes me a sinner and I will sin. Sin is the reason why I don't have the Holy Spirit and I need Jesus to take care of my sin problem and give me the Holy Spirit, right? Right? So understand the implication. The consequence of sin, the punishment of sin is you don't have the Holy Spirit. Because of sin, our punishment is we're cut off from the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That's the consequence and punishment of sin. So if now Jesus is going to take your punishment and take your consequence of sin upon him, that means Jesus now has to experience what it's like not to have the Holy Spirit and the Father in fellowship with him. You understand now where I'm going with this? Is it making sense? Exactly, first and last. If Jesus is going to take the consequences of our sin, the punishment of our sin, then that means he's going to experience what we experience because of sin no fellowship with the spirit or the father even the son right so now he's going to take your punishment to pay your debt and experience 
the consequences you deserve because he's our sin bearer, which means no fellowship with the Father and the Spirit. Right? Right? Isaiah 59, verses 1 to 2. Isaiah 59, verses 1 to 2. Exactly, life is good. Isaiah 59, verses 1 to 2. Behold, Jehovah's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. He's powerful enough to save you. Neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear. He hears everything. So why doesn't he save us? But your iniquities have separated you. Separated between you and your God. You see why God doesn't hear your prayers, doesn't save you, though he's powerful enough to save you? Your sins have separated you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Is it clear now? Are you getting it? Okay, now, Amos chapter 8, verses 9 to 10. Amos chapter 8, verses 9 to 10. I've shared this in the past in my classes. Al Darius used to come to my classes. You remember this? So I'm sharing it for your benefit. And I know I'm going to have to share it again because we have to hear it more than once for it to sink in. And some of us have gotten cold and callous. We have forsaken our first love. We're not as zealous as we used to. May the Holy Spirit put our hearts on fire, flame our hearts on fire to return back to our first love and do what we used to do in Jesus' name. Amen, Al? Because we're not doing what we used to do. The Bible studies, the fellowship, the prayers, and we've forsaken that. Anyway, Amos 8, 9 to 10. Read with me. Amos 8, 9 to 10. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith Adonai Jehovah, the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in clear day. Notice, I'm going to bring judgment on the land. I'm going to make it become dark at noon. At noon is going to be dark. And when is he going to do it? When is he going to do it? And I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs unto lamentation. I will bring up, up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only son and the end thereof as a bitter day. Notice what God just said in Amos 8, 9 to 10. He says, here's a sign of judgment on the land. I'm going to make it go dark at noon during your feasts. And I'm going to make you mourn as the loss of a firstborn, an only son. Right? You understand what you just read? When I bring judgment on the land, this is how you know I'm bringing judgment. Darkness at noon is going to go complete dark during your feasts, right? And I'm going to make you weep. I'm going to make you cry as if you had lost, right, your only son. Now, why was it bitter to lose an only son? Because the only son was your heir who continued your name and would take care of you in your old age. To lose your son, you lose your inheritance and have no one to take care of you in your old age. So it's very bitter. So notice what was the sign of judgment? Darkness at noon during your feast and the death of an only son. Jesus was nailed during the feast of Passover. During the feast of Passover, Jesus hung on a cross and at noon it became dark. Mark 15, 33. Mark 15, 33. Mark 15, 33. Exactly, Bill Thompson. Read. Mark 15, 33. And when the sixth hour was come, check any source. Sixth hour is the noon. Sixth hour in Jewish reckoning is noon. When noon came, there was darkness over the whole land until ninth hour, until 3 p.m. During the feast of Passover. So that means the Jew who knew his Bible would say, wait. In the Old Testament, it says, when God is going to judge the land, darkness at noon during our feast. It's the feast of Passover, and it's dark at noon. God is angry. He's pouring judgment. But on who? Who is he judging? 
the only son on the cross was about to die. The only son Did you catch it? Exactly, Angela. What have we done to the only Son of God? <clears throat> See, I'm about to get moved in my spirit. My sins, your sins, resulted in the loss of the only Son. During the Feast of Passover, where darkness came at noon as a sign that the Father and the Spirit had, were pouring out judgment. But who? Who? The one hanging on the cross. And then the son swallowed it. Guys, let me break this down. <clears throat> you guys are going to make me cry with your comments, right? We're murderers. We're, you're going to make me cry with your comments. Now, I don't want to keep crying. You're going to think, God, oh, this guy's just acting for sympathy. And it's not. May the Lord purify our hearts. The son on the cross at noon <clears throat> says, okay, Father, <clears throat> I'm ready. Let me swallow the cup. And he took it whole. He took it whole from noon to three in the afternoon. He drank it. Abba, spirit, pour out the cup, which I drink in their place. And he swallows it whole. You catch it? Do you understand what happened here? Now let's go to Mark 15, 34 and see what's happening. Mark 15, 34 and see what's happening. Why then did God remove darkness at three in the afternoon? Mark 15, 34. Pay, pay attention to this, folks, because I'm not going to tie it in with John. Watch here, guys. Read. Read this with me, Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, remember, it was darkness from six to the ninth hour. Now, you know why the ninth hour, the darkness was removed? Here's why. You guys got to follow me here. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, people misread this. Jesus is not saying, why have you abandoned me? Guys, pay attention. Jesus is not saying, why have you abandoned me? If you read this, it's Psalm 22. In the psalm, the psalmist is not saying, why have you abandoned me? He's saying... How much longer will it take for you to come to my salvation? Go to Psalm 22, verse 1. Let me prove it to you. The meaning of the words is, how much longer must I wait for your salvation? Psalm 22, verse 1. So I can explain it. Let me show you the explanation. Psalm 22, verse 1. Yeah, Serena, pay attention. I'm going to prove it. It's not my opinion. He's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. Watch the context of the words of our Lord Jesus. Psalm 22, verse 1. To the chief musician upon Ijeleth Shahar, a psalm of David, my God, my God, why have you why hast thou forsaken me? Watch. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? It's not a cry of why you abandoned me. It's a cry of how much more longer must I wait before you come to my salvation? Do you see it? Do you see it here? Yes, it's the same thing, friends. Don't get hung up on Aramaic. It's all the same. Don't let George Lemsa deceive you. He was a deceiver who mis misquoted the scripture. To prove to you it's not why have you abandoned me, but my God, how much longer must I endure this judgment? When will you come to my aid? Let me prove it. Psalm 22, 23 to 24. Psalm 22, 23 to 24. I'm going to tie it in. Tying it in, man. You asked for it. Tying it in. Psalm 22, 23 to 24. Exactly, medic. You're catching it. Ye that fear Jehovah, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. Why? Notice 24. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Bam, there you go. Rejoice with me when I cried, he heard. Folks, do you know why the darkness ended at the ninth hour? It started at noon and it ended at the ninth hour. It ended because Jesus prayed for it to end. 
The reason why the darkness was removed at the ninth hour is because that's when Jesus said, how much longer? And you know why at the ninth hour he said, how much longer? John 19, 28. Let's go back. Exactly, Bill Thompson. John 19, 28. Let's go back. Here's the answer. I'm going to tie it in. Yes, St. Dennis. It's all about Jesus. Okay. John 19, 28. Read with me. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now let's tie it in. Jesus realized, I have now drunk the cup fully. I have satisfied divine justice. I thirst. And then he says, my God, my God, how much longer now that I've accomplished salvation? And the answer, you know what it is? Pay attention. The answer is this. Son, it's over. You've done it. <clears throat> Man, it's going to move me in my spirit. <clears throat> Son, you've done it. <clears throat> you've done it. The wrath is over. Judgment is over. Son, it's finished. And here's the sign it's finished. I'm going to remove the darkness. And that's when Jesus says in John 19.30, It is finished! Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. <clears throat> in other words, what was being said is, I have now drunk the, of the cup. I have accomplished redemption. I ache for you. I ache for the spirit. I thirst for you. I thirst for the spirit. How much longer, Father, now that it's accomplished? And the Father says, Come home. <clears throat> Come home. Come home to the two who love you more than anything. Come home to me, son, and come home to the Spirit. We love you and we ache for you. We love you and we ache for you. Then he says it for us. It is finished. Abba, into your hands I commit my spirit. Luke 23, 46, right? If you want to know what Jesus was thirsting for, Psalm 42, verses 1 or 2. Psalm 42, verses 1 or 2. Our God is beautiful, friends. Friends, Toma. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. Tell me if this is not the words of Jesus. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. Notice the words of Jesus. This is what Jesus was saying in John 19, 28. I thirst. To the chief musician, Maschil, for the sons of Korah, as the heart, as the deer, panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth, thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Right there. That's Jesus. As the deer pants for waters, my soul thirsts for you, my God, my Father. When will I come and appear before your presence? Psalm 63, verse 1. Psalm 63, verse 1. Yeah, exactly. How can you not cry? Psalm 63, verse 1. I'm going to wrap it up. Broken fellowship, intimacy, and the judgment of God being poured on him. A Psalm of David, when he was in the wilderness of Judah, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. And that's what he experienced. No water. He experienced forsakenness for us. So basically, now that Jesus had swallowed the cup, I thirst. My God, my God, how much more longer? I ache for you and the Holy Spirit. And the Father says, it's done, son. It's done. You did it. My son, my heart, my love. You did it. You brought about a salvation of our people and all creation. Come home. 
Come home, son. Come home. And the spirit, the spirit. You can imagine the father and the spirit saying, we love you. We adore you. We love you. We adore you, son. <clears throat> right? And the son, how I ache and thirst for you, father. How I ache and thirst for you, Holy Spirit. Because Holy Spirit, you are my companion. And I love you. And that's what happened. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Redemption accomplished. That's why now when you hear that song, as the deer panteth for the waters, it should take a whole different meaning. Think of Jesus on the cross. So that's what happened. That's what happened. That's the price. But understand, this price means the Father's heart shattered. The Holy Spirit's heart shattered. The Son's heart shattered. Let alone the disciples of Christ, like his mother who was there, shattered. For the first time in the eternal reality of the Trinity. Let me end it with this. The first time. Before creation, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're going to make me cry, Bill Thompson. You're going to make me cry. I don't want to be crying. You're going to say, oh, this guy cries. It's all a show. It's not, really. The first, before creation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All they knew was perfect love, fellowship, communion, joy. Because they loved one another perfectly, infinitely. They enjoyed one another and they never experienced sadness or heartache. Did you know when God created the universe and gave man the choice to rebel? When creation rebelled, this was the first time. The first time the Godhead experienced pain, sadness, misery, and anger. Something they never experienced before they created the creation. And then, because of their love for us, for the first time in their eternal existence, the Godhead would have to experience broken fellowship. And the Son would have to become the object of the cup of the wrath that the Father and Spirit would pour out. Breaking decimating the hearts of the Father and the Spirit and the Son. That's why now you appreciate Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he was saying, Father, take this cup away from me, yet not my will, your will be not. He wasn't saying, God, I'm scared of dying physically. Even the martyrs like Paul showed more boldness in the face of physical death. To say that Jesus was scared of physical death is an insult. What he was dreading, what he was dreading, this is basically the gist of Jesus' prayer. If it's possible that I don't have to drink this cup, which means for a moment in time, I'm going to experience God forsakenness, broken intimacy with you and the spirit whom I love more than anything. Something my inner person dreads, which is hell for me. This is my hell. If I don't have to experience it, take it away. But not my will and your will be done. And you know what the father said? Son, if you don't drink it, they will have to. This is the only way. And then Jesus says, your will be done, father. Your will be done. So when you look Jesus in the face, <clears throat> when you see him and you see the, the marks, the holes in his hands and his feet in the side, not only is that a reminder of what I did to you, but you'll also be reminded of this. He's going to look at you and say, you know how much we love you? You know how much the Father loved you? You know how much the Spirit loves you? You know how much I love you? We went to hell and experienced hell to save you so you can be with us. Because of you, we experience broken intimacy and fellowship for a moment in time. That's the price we all three voluntarily paid to make you our everlasting possession. You understand this love? He's going to look at you. You're going to look at him. 
And I can honestly say from my heart, I can honestly say from my heart, I'm not worth it, Lord. I'm not worth it. I'm not worth it. You didn't deserve to go through this for me. You didn't, Lord. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't. I'll never be able to repay you. I can never thank you enough. So I ask one thing, Jesus. In this world now, in this sinful body that I succumb to, please help me to hate my flesh, to die to my flesh, not indulge it, and not fail you, because I don't want to break your heart anymore. Okay? So this is the message. This is the message, right? That's what the God had paid. It's a long session, but please go back and listen to it. Pass it to others. Take these notes and share it. Share it because now you have a different perspective of the cross. This perspective, yeah. So you got to hear a filthy, rabid, rabid dog of Satan, John Connolly, a wicked, filthy, stupid dog of Satan. It's not even moved what God did because he thinks he knows God, but he belongs to his father, the devil. Right? This view here, this view here, guys, this view will now make you also appreciate not only the pain of the sun. You know what it's going to make you do? It's going to make you understand the Father's heart and the Spirit's heart, their hearts. Let me, let me repeat again. You understand this teaching? You know what it says? We shattered the hearts of the Father and the Spirit, not just the Son. You understand? Can you imagine? Imagine this scene. Now, again, I'm not saying it happened, but I can imagine the Father and the Spirit in heaven looking and the angels looking at the Father and the Spirit and wondering, when are you going to intervene? And if the Father had manifested a human face and the Spirit had manifested a human face, you know what the angels would have seen? You know what they would have seen if they were manifesting a visible face? The angels would have seen for the first time the Father and the Spirit shedding tears. <laughs> if they were in visible form, I only would see the son crying. They would see the father. They would see the spirit crying, shedding tears. The father, my son, Libby, Libby Bible, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> my companion, my friend, my companion, my friend. That's what they would have seen. So walk away with the fact every person of the Godhead suffered because of that. So now pray for me, his prophet, prophetless, imperfect, arrogant, wicked, unteachable servant, that God will make me holy and pure, and not be a hypocrite, filled with the love from the Spirit, to be in love with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and to love you and be patient with you and to be more like Jesus and pray for my daughters, my angels, that just Jesus will cover them with his blood and bring them back to me and provide through me for them and save me from this trial of the devil and this fine and preserve the money to get on my feet and pray that I can be released and start a new life. Al, I'll see you soon, brother. Khiltal in October. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father, Holy Spirit. Lord, will I try to see you tomorrow? Again, I, th I think I'll do another session tomorrow. Yeah, I, I should be able to. It'll be uh, this time. It'll be 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time. God willing. Okay, love you guys. All right. Pray for me to be pure and God be patient with me. Thank you for being patient with me. Love you guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed.